It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Good morning, Speaker. Good morning, Speaker. Yesterday, the Premier said there was no rhyme or reason to how lands were selected to be protected as part of the Greenbelt, Speaker. He said the Greenbelt was formed by, and I'm going to quote him here, a bunch of staffers in a room with crayons and highlighters and randomly just went on a map. Speaker, if the Premier thinks the Green Belt wasn't formed using a proper process, well, can he finally share his process for removing lands from the Green Belt? To reply, the Premier. Yesterday, because that's the truth. I talked to people that were in the room. They sat there with a big map, and they literally got highlighters, Mr. Speaker, a bunch of uh, staffers, and lo joking around going up and down the roads. And we know that's true. Do you know why, Mr. Speaker? The Liberals changed it 17 times. They decreased the green belt. We increased it by over 2,000 acres. And some land, Mr. Speaker, shouldn't be in the green belt, and some should be in the green belt. And we're expanding the areas that we feel should be in the green belt. Supplementary question. I tell you, you know, it really makes you wonder, though, Speaker. If this government's process was a bunch of Conservative Party donors in a back room with crayons and highlighters and a map of the land they could buy up in order to turn a profit. Because the reality is that after the Conservatives were elected, six developers paid a combined $278 million for land that could not be developed within the Green Belt. Then suddenly it was all removed. And Speaker, five of these developers have lobbying records revealing their connections back to the Conservative Party. No one would spend that kind of money if they didn't think it would be open for development and they could cash in. Yep. So again, to the Premier, how did this government decide which parcels of land would be removed from the Green Belt? Premier. The decision is very easy. We're in a housing crisis right now. Costs are going through the roof. It's very simple, supply and demand. When we looked at the map, it's butt up against existing communities. As a matter of fact, one, one piece of a field, I call it, about 10 acres, had housing all around, all four corners, and an empty field with weeds in it. They call that the green belt? That's not the green belt. That's just a field with a bunch of weeds, and people around that neighborhood all want it to be developed. The final supplementary. I, wow. Um, very technical analysis there by the Premier. Uh, the Conservatives? Order. Green Belt Grab? Order. The, Order. the Conservatives Green Belt Grab is not about housing. If this government cared about investing in Ontario's housing stock, we'd see investment in public housing and in building homes that everyday Ontarians could actually afford to live in not luxury mansions on sprawl. Ontarians Order. are following the money. They know it's not about housing. It's about insiders with connections to the Conservatives buying up Order. land, super cheap, and then selling it off, developing it for incredible profit. Once again, to the Premier, one more chance. Who was holding the crayons when the government decided to sell off the green box? And to reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Another Stop fable the by the New Democratic Party is yeah. being told in the yeah. legislature this morning. You know, she talks about, uh, Speaker, through you, she talks about public commitment for housing. Well, Minister Beth and Falvey, under the leadership of Premier Ford, tabled a wonderful budget. You can ask the Minister to withdraw his unparliamentary comment and conclude his answer. Um, you know, we added $202 million to our homelessness prevention program, and I want to thank members from both, so both sides of the House for doing some great announcements last week. Yep. In fact, one of the ones was the member for Niagara West, who okay. made a fantastic announcement that the member for Niagara Falls was pleased to attend. So some of her own members yeah. are celebrating the public commitment this here, government's here. made the to ending homelessness yeah. by adding that additional $202 million. I don't know about the Leader of the Opposition, Response. but some of her members have got with the program. Here, here. The next question. Order. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. 
Yesterday, my colleague, the member for Sudbury, stood in this House and told us that a hospice in his riding is having to rely on a food bank and fundraisers in order to feed its residents. And this government responded by bragging about generous individual donations. Speaker, it's almost as though this government wants Ontarians to think that this is normal, that it's perfectly normal for a hospice where people go for end-of-life care to have to rely on a food bank so its residents don't go hungry in their final days. Speaker, my question is to the Premier, and it's a simple one. Does this government think that that is acceptable? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I, uh, I also should have highlighted yesterday, and the member from Sudbury would know this, that earlier this year, we actually gave that particular hospice over $2 million. Wow. Why? Because we saw the need, we saw the excellent work that they were doing, we saw the pressures that they were under as a result of ongoing um, commitments that they have within their community to ensure that that hospital can, hospice can continue to provide the excellent service. But you know, Speaker, in our health document, we actually talk about expansions to hospice and palliative care because we have a government as a government have made that commitment and will continue to make that commitment because we understand and appreciate how important palliative and hospice are in our province and continue to Supplementary. Speaker, it is shocking enough for a hospice to rely on a food bank, but usage is up across the board too. I've been traveling around this province listening to ordinary Ontarians, and what I've been seeing is shocking. People working full-time jobs and who can't get by. People visiting food banks for the first time. One in 14 families in the Waterloo region. In Vaughan Woodbridge, 36% of food bank visitors were children. In Kawartha Lakes, it's 50%. In Mississauga, food bank use is up 400% over the last eight years. Speaker, food banks have asked this government to tackle the root causes of food insecurity, yet the most recent budget provides almost nothing. Will this government bring in measures like real rent control to make life more affordable Question. for ordinary Ontarians? To reply, the parliamentary assistant and member for Oakville. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And you know, if I was the opposition, this is probably not a path I would walk down. And, and the reason is because you have voted against every single measure we have taken to help the people of Ontario. Let's, let's take a look at what the government of Ontario has done to help the people of Ontario. We have reduced energy costs so families can, af can afford reliable, reliable energy. We have kept transit affordable by, doubling, by removing doubling fares and extending fare integration. We are supporting parents with 46,000 new childcare spaces since we took office, saving parents on average $8,500. We are also helping post-secondary students with a 10% tuition freeze, which the opposition has opposed. And importantly, we've also brought in the most important tax credit in the Spons. history of Ontario with the lift tax credit, lowering taxes for lower-income individuals. Where was the opposition when we brought these proposals forward? And the final supplementary. Wake up. Wake up. We don't support your plan because it's not working. I wish this government would spend less time in the back rooms and more time talking to real people in this province who are really struggling right now. I was recently in Northumberland County, Speaker, where a single person on Ontario Works has to spend as much as 50 per cent of their very limited income on food at a time when housing costs, costs there and across this province are going through the roof. Speaker, food banks were created as a temporary measure. They're supposed to be a Band-Aid solution, and now we have way too many people relying on them just to be able to survive. Order. To the Premier, Order. will this government immediately double Question. OW and ODSP rates to get people the relief they need so people do not go hungry in the province of Ontario? I'll ask the members to take their seats. And I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The response, the member for Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. And again, you know, we understand that there, there are 
issues with inflation in this country, to, to which uh, I would hope the, op the opposition would understand with grocery Order. inflation, with the Ukraine war and other issues. However, we have made initiatives to help the people of Ontario. We put through a Order. gas tax cut uh, just last year and extended it through this year for 5.7 cents a litre. Again, if I recall, the opposition voted against that. That is helping every single Order. family in this, in this province, every single business, lower costs, bring inflation down and help people to be able to uh, feed their families and help, help those businesses. We've also, in this most recent budget, helped low-income seniors by expanding the GAINS program. Exactly. We've also increased ODSP payments and increased it by 5% as well as expanding the number of people that are Response. eligible for this program. So again, we will continue supporting the people of Ontario. We're seeing record employment growth, record business investment, and the people of Ontario are on a good trajectory right now. Thank you. The next question. The member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Children in Niagara are going hungry at school under this government's watch. Niagara Nutrition Partners, which provides breakfast, snacks, and lunches to students, have been forced to close nutrition programs at 16 schools, with nearly 50 more being affected. They face a significant funding gap from the province at food prices swore. Students can't learn and thrive when hungry. Where they have gone from feeding 17,000 kids to 24,000 kids a day. It's shameful that this government will allow such a reality for children in the province. Speaker, will the Premier follow the lead of other provinces across the country and provide the necessary emergency funding so children in Niagara don't go hungry? Thank you. Respond. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Speaker, I thank the honourable member for the important question. Mr. Speaker, the student nutrition program that the, that the member is referring, referring to is receiving an annual funding of $27.9 million, Mr. Speaker. We've said from the beginning, we will make sure that student and youth deserve, who deserve all the support get it in every way, shape or form. Mr. Speaker, if you look at the support that we provided to, to the municipalities, the $1.2 billion, that helped them with food, Mr. Speaker, with housing, with shelter, the program to feed on $8 million towards Feed Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and an $83 million towards the Ontario Trillium Foundation to provide grants to help with food, food banks across the province. Mr. Speaker, once again, we will be there for the children, for youth and families across this province, and we will not let them down every day. Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question, members of St. Catherine. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Let's be crystal clear. Here are the numbers from the border to Beamsville. 16, sco 16 schools have closed their nutrition program. 30 more are projected to close. 49 have been affected. We are facing a $400,000 shortfall. We all know food prices are going up, affordability is down, but this is not an excuse to let children go hungry. That's right. I need a response from the minister that puts these children first. I need to hear these words. This is not okay. I am going to look into it. Speaker to the minister. Will you commit to assessing this program and will you commit to emergency funding so children Question. In Niagara, do not go hungry. Great question. Once again, remind members to make the comments to the chair. To reply, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. And Mr. Speaker, I can assure the member that not a single children or youth will ever be forgotten under this government, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. That's why. And I'll be very clear. I'll be very clear, Mr. Speaker. Under the previous government, the program, the student nutrition program, Mr. Speaker, was just receiving support and investment of over $8 million. Today, that amount is $27.9 million, Mr. Speaker. Now, Mr. Speaker, the, the member is asking for action. I asked my honourable colleague, I told her from day one that I will work night and day to make sure that every single program that's being offered to people of this province is at its best, and every day we'll make sure that it's improved. I asked the honourable member to join us. Order. The cost of living is rising. Why are they supporting a carbon tax that adds a cost to every single thing in this province, Mr. Speaker?
There's a great deal of enthusiasm in the House this morning, on both sides. We have 45 minutes to go. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Oakville North Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Over the past decade, Ontario's population has grown rapidly. This means that more families now call Ontario home and more children have enrolled into our publicly funded education system. The previous Liberal government failed to plan for the future and shamefully closed 600 schools at a time when they should have addressed the growth in our province. I'm hearing concerns from parents about the importance of their children being able to attend a school near them. Families are counting on our government to take action when it comes to providing top quality schools for their children. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is ensuring that new and existing schools will address future growth needs? Minister of Education. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Oakville, North Burlington. She's a school building machine, five schools in four years. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, a strong advocate for the people of Oakville and North Burlington. Now, Mr. Speaker, while in Halton Region, we have wonderful municipal partners to work with us to get schools built anywhere between one to three years. In many of our communities, it takes upwards of a decade to build a school. That's going to come to an end. The Premier is committed to getting on with uh, streamlining and overhauling our capital approval process so we build for where the growth is. We have 300,000 people, according to federal immigration targets, coming next year and every year. We have to work harder and smarter to build better for our kids. And This plan in the legislation allows us to streamline approvals, enables joint-use projects with community, allows school boards to work together and collaborate to share their assets for educational Box. purposes. It enables us to build through a $14 billion capital plan to renew schools and, and build new schools for the future, Speaker. Thank you. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that great response and for those five new schools in my community. Strong public education and a sustainable school infrastructure system are fundamental in meeting the needs of growing communities like mine in Oakville, North Burlington, and across Ontario. Across our province, many communities continue to welcome and embrace Ukrainian refugees who are fleeing persecution and war in their home country. In our local schools, Ukrainian children have been welcomed into classrooms where they are receiving a top quality education in communities that they now call home. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting our schools to provide a safe, and welcoming environment for Ukrainian children and their families. Minister of Education. Thank you, very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I mean, Canada has been through our history a safe haven for individuals fleeing persecution and war. And that is a great heritage we could be proud of as Canadians. And of course, Ukrainians are fleeing a war zone due to uh, Vladimir Putin's genocidal war an illegal war that has created so much impact on so many people around the world. And of course, Canada has opened our arms, Ontario has opened our arms, and in our education system, through the most recent funding announcement, we have reaffirmed again to school boards we will fund every Ukrainian child that comes to our country to have free, publicly funded education. We are extending subsidies and daycare for their mothers and their parents and guardians. We are ensuring mental health supports in their language through a partnership with the Canadian Ukrainian Congress. We are working together to make sure that those children who have faced so much trauma and affliction have the supports and the confidence that they can succeed in this country. Speaker. The next question, the member for Ottawa West European. Thank you, Speaker. With food inflation at 10 percent, this government has given Meals on Wheels in Ottawa just a 2 percent increase and taken away their emergency subsidies. As a result, on April 1, Meals on Wheels had to increase prices. For their lowest income clients, prices increased over 300 percent. Seniors, people with disabilities, and patients just released from the hospital depend on these meals for nutritious food. But since the price increase, some of Ottawa's most vulnerable residents have had to cancel their meals. 
Why is this government making vulnerable people go without food instead of providing community organizations like Meals on Wheels with decent support? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I'm, I'm not sure where the member was when we had our budget, but there was actually a very substantial increase in community care and community support, like the organizations uh, like Meals on Wheels, because we know because of the, the injection and use of volunteers, community commitment, as well as paid Order. staff. The Meals on Wheels organizations in all of our ridings have done exceptional work during the pandemic while we needed to keep those connections. And we have committed, and uh, uh, in fact, I met uh, uh, last week with organizations to talk about how the investments we announced in the budget can be used to most effectively continue to treat our seniors and our most vulnerable in community, just as we've highlighted in our Your Health document. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, back to the Premier. I regret to inform the Minister uh, she really should have consulted some of her senior officials because Meals on Wheels Ottawa, Meals on Wheels elsewhere, right, colleagues? Yep. They aren't reporting any increases in their budget, are they? Nope. nope. So there seems to be a disconnect, Speaker, between what this government yes. wants to believe and what organizations that are working hard to help seniors and people with disabilities and people in poverty. And you have to ask the question, why is this government defunding Meals on Wheels? Right. Why is this government wanting to push people into the arms of the grocery store chains that are ripping people off with price gouging on bread, milk and other essentials? Could it be, Speaker, because this Premier is personal friends with the Weston family? Could it be, Speaker, because this Premier once said, God bless the Weston family? Is that why... Stop the clock. Stop the clock. I, I'm going to caution the member on his use of language, first of all, um, it, because of the reaction it caused in the House, and remind members that uh, it is in the standing orders that we should not uh, impute unavowed motives. Is there still time? Okay. I'll, I'll allow the member to conclude his question. Well, thank Speaker, I just want to ask the Premier, why is he favouring profits for law laws over funding for Meals on Wheels? Deputy Premier, Minister of Health. Well, I, I'm going to tomorrow make sure that the member opposite has a copy of the endorsement of the investments that we've made from community organizations like Meals on Wheels who understand that the investments that we announced in the budget are going to make a quantitative difference to the lives of the people that they serve in community. And that means organizations like Meals on Wheels because we know, appreciate and understand what they are doing, we have made an additional investment in the budget and I'll be sure to make sure you get a copy of the press release. Although you did get a copy. Next question. Member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. You know, under the previous Liberal government, key infrastructure, tourism and recreational facilities like Ontario Place were unfortunately neglected. Stop it, stop it. Instead of making investments and partnering with businesses Order. to enhance the iconic waterfront location, they chose to close many of the features and attractions. True. Ontario Place still holds great potential and opportunities for year-round enjoyment and as a place for everyone, no matter if it's Ontario families or you're coming from somewhere around the world. And that is why our government must not act now to follow through on our promise to bring Ontario Place back to life. We cannot allow this once-in-a-generation opportunity to pass us by. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government's plan is to revive the amazing Ontario Place? To respond, Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The member is absolutely right. We are bringing Ontario Place back to life. We will be making it a place that everyone can enjoy. Yesterday, I joined Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport and the Premier to announce that we are bringing, moving the Science Centre to Ontario Place. We also announced that Live Nation will be renewing th their lease with the province of Ontario, but also building a brand new stage that will be yeah. active and operational yeah. awesome. all year round. 
wonderful tenants like the Science Centre, Live Nation and Thermae. There will be lots for families to do and we are so excited that families will be able to spend all day there from morning till night, all every day. single day Great. of the year. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for that response. You know, under the leadership of this government, our Ontario clearly has a vision and a plan for Ontario Place. You know, that's going to make it once again the world-class destination that, it m m that once was. And I remember as a young girl coming here in the late 70s with my dad to visit Ontario Place. But it's changed so much. You know, now we go see concerts and you see places that cl are closed and it's derelict and it needs paint and it needs upgrades. There's so much more we can do to make that place so much better. So I just, despite these years of neglect and de deterioration, you know, it's really sad that previous governments did not see this jewel in our community and fix it up and take that time. So I once again want to thank the Minister for your leadership and can you please expand on some of the new features and plans that will rebuild and revitalize Ontario Place for generations to come. Mr. We are bringing it back to life. In fact, work will start in May in terms of the site servicing so that we can have electricity and running water and improve the quality of water on the site. But Mr. Speaker, what I'm most excited about was um, releasing the final renderings of the whole vision of Ontario Place, which include 43 acres of public realm and park wow. space, which is bigger than Trinity Bellwoods Park. This wonderful space will now have Boardwalks, piers, public beaches, waterfront access, a brand new marina, children's play areas, as well as food and beverage. Mr. Speaker, we are excited that the final renderings are out in the public. We are completing the environmental assessment and we will bring Ontario Place We're back it to it. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Over 550 tenants of Livemore High Park signed and delivered a letter asking their corporate landlord, GWL Realty, to stop rent increases of up to 14% this year. GWLR responded, saying that the building being new is not subject to guideline rent increases and pointed out that rent for a one-bedroom in High Park has gone up 46% compared to last year. Does the Premier believe that a 46% increase in rent is manageable by tenants. Reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. The member opposite uh, has a fundamental difference with the government on creating affordable housing. We're in the middle of a housing supply crisis, and we're going to do everything we can in our power to build more purpose-built rental. We made a conscious decision. We, we delivered on our promise to existing tenants to protect rent control, and in 2018, we made the exemption in the fall economic statement for one reason, Speaker, and one reason only, and that was to incent the construction of purpose-built rent. Resupply. What happened last year, Speaker? I've record. said it many times in the House. The record. We had a record yep. of 15,000 purpose-built rental starts in Ontario because of that. And already. Already this year, we're seeing bright signs in, the, in this city. We're seeing permits for purpose-built rental five times higher than they were Response. at the same time a, a year ago. Lots of the supplementary question. Speaker, what tenants in Ontario have experienced under this government is skyrocketing rents. This is over 550 tenants and their families impacted in just one neighbourhood in my riding. Imagine how many tenants are impacted across this province. There has to be some predictability of how much one can expect to pay in rent year after year. No one can manage unpredictable cost of living increases. Minister, will you ensure that all tenants, regardless of when their building was built, can have stability in their rents? Minister of we are not going to go back to the failed policies of the 90s when they were in power and no purpose-built rental was built in Ontario. We're not going to go back. We invoked the cap speaker this year because of the inflationary rate to ensure that the maximum under rent control was 2.5 percent. We delivered in the middle of the pandemic. The Attorney General blocked evictions in the middle of the pandemic to protect the most vulnerable. We capped 
uh, rent increases in the middle of the pandemic. We have stood up year after year after year to protect tenants and strengthen the stock of community housing and purpose-built rental housing, and we are going to continue. The question, though, Speaker, before the House, with all of our renter protections in the bill before the House, Bill 97, the question is, will that member and her party, the New Democrats, support Response. those rental protection measures in Bill 97? I yes doubt or it. no? I doubt it. Thank you. The next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The housing affordability crisis is getting worse, not better. Over 185,000 families are on a wait list for social housing. Until the mid-90s, Canada was building 20,000 non-profit and co-op houses each and every year. In Ontario alone, 14,000 co-op homes were built between 1989 and 1995. In fact, 93% of our current below market rental supply was built before 1996. But instead of building more homes that people can actually afford in the communities they want to live in, this government is imposing an expensive sprawl agenda that municipalities and families simply cannot afford. So, Speaker, Question. I want to give the Premier an opportunity today to commit to making the financial investment to build 122,000 nonprofit and co op homes deeply affordable over the next decade. To reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thanks for the question. You know, the, I, I always say this about the Liberal Green Alliance. You know, they always talk a good game in their questions, but they never, they never deliver on it when the votes come. Exactly what this member talks about: allowing, you know, a young family to have the opportunity to to build a home that meets their needs and their budget close to where they grew up. That's exactly what the policies that we're consulting on right now will provide. You know, the member talks about, you know, supporting farms and farm families. You know. It's going to be very interesting, Speaker, to see if he supports our initiatives to allow, you know, sons and daughters of farmers to be able to have a property, uh, you know, want. on the family farm, That's or, or more importantly. You know, to talk about workers and the opportunity to, to have a, a lot on a farm to upgrade, the, the opportunity for farm, farm workers to have uh, you know, employment, uh, and, and not just employment, but a home there. We've put all of those policies down in some progressive you know, bills in this House. This member has voted down every single time. The supplementary question. Speaker, I don't vote for legislation that doesn't work. Like, that's just kind of how I roll over here. So I actually want some legislation that's going to build affordable homes and communities people want to live. So maybe the minister is saying that he will support my Bills 44 and Bill 45 that allows four plexes and four-story walk-up apartments, will allow six to 11-story mid-rise apartments as Order. of right in this, in this province. Let's get rid of that red tape and allow people to build homes and communities they want to live in instead of paving over the farmland that feeds us, Order. contributes $50 billion to the province's economy. Speaker, is it... Okay. Stop the clock. Stop. The Minister of Municipal Affairs will get a chance to respond if he chooses to do so. In the meantime, I encourage him to... Oh, okay. Well, in any of I apologize to the member for Guelph and start the clock. And you can conclude your question. His answer. Well, I know I, it's good the Premier is excited because I'm excited for the answer. Will, will the government support Bill 44 and Bill 40, or 45 to build homes instead of paving over the farmland that feeds us? The Premier. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you for the question from the, the member. I just want to give some stats. Stats can that came out in February's numbers. 25% increase in condo permits. The highest increase in the, in the entire country, which is great. But do you know what, Mr. Speaker, do you know what really irks me? 
I really like the, the leader of the Green Party, but let, let me tell you something. It's a little rich when he gets up and he says housing, housing, as, as the Minister of Municipal Affairs says, it's all talk, no action. In Guelph, there's 444 municipalities in this entire province. Guess who has the lowest housing starts? It's his, his riding from Guelph, but this even gets better. This even gets better, Mr. Speaker. The member didn't stand up. And we have a housing crisis for students at University of Guelph. On the University of Guelph's property, guess what? They voted it down. They won't even give the kids, and he was in favor of it. That is terrible. He talks a good game. Thank you. Thank you. The next question. Stop the clock. The government side will come to order. Okay. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. My constituents in Richmond Hill are deeply concerned about the safety of our neighbourhoods. They are concerned about increased levels of crime. This is a serious issue impacting many of our communities, especially in the GTA. People should, be afraid, should not be afraid to use public transit, commute to work or going shopping. Public safety needs to be a priority because it affects all of us in our daily lives and is important for ensuring strong and prosperous neighbourhoods. People are looking to our government for the leadership and solutions to get crime under control. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please explain what actions our government is taking to address crime in our province? Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleague and wish her a very happy birthday. But the member, Mr. Speaker, the member is absolutely correct. Public safety must be the centre point of our attention as urgent change is needed. And two weeks ago, as members will remember, this House came together in voting for a motion to call on the federal government to implement meaningful bail reform. And I can assure this House that our government is looking forward to working with our federal counterparts, including Minister Mendicino, and we are ready to assist in any way we can to see critical change and reform as soon as possible. This matter cannot wait, and this House sent a strong message that signaled with our unanimous vote. Mr. Speaker, maintaining law and order Spons. is impossible without our police services. The men and women in uniform who put their lives on the line need our support, and we will always have their backs. <laughs> Supplementary question. And thank you to the Solicitor General for that response. On behalf of my community in Richmond Hill, it is great to hear that the government is continuing to support our police services. This goes a long way in keeping Ontario safe. However, for the people of our province, there are other issues that relate to public safety and crime prevention. The first concern is about how our police are tackling large-scale criminal activity, and the second is about the importance of bail reform policies. One of my birthday wishes is to have that bail reform under control. Thank you, so can the, can the speaker and the solicitor, uh, speaker, can the solicitor general please explain how the important issues of bail reform will benefit Ontario? Thank you. Solicitor General. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And just last month, the York Regional Police, the Toronto Police, the OPP, and the Durham Police, working collaboratively with our federal government and the U.S. government, held a successful operation they called Money Penny. Approximately, and this is incredible, 1.5 kilos of fentanyl and car fentanyl were seized. In addition, 86 illegal guns were seized. Mr. Speaker, we know that the majority of those firearms were smuggled into Canada from the U.S. and sold illegally. And this is not new. And that's why we're calling for greater border protection. As a result of Operation Monty Penny, some offenders were charged with failure to comply in the courts. And that's why we need bail reform, as the member said. Our message to the people of Ontario is simple. The safety of Ontarians is always our highest priority. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I'm glad to see uh, my students from Scarborough Southwest are here today as well. So my question is to the Minister of Education, Speaker. Schools in Scarborough Southwest are falling apart, literally falling apart. And it is unacceptable that despite the urgent facility needs identified by schools and school boards, our children are forced to learn in poorly equipped classrooms. Speaker. This government claims to be making historic investment while simultaneously committing less than inflation and underspending their education bu budget by hundreds of millions of dollars. So my question is, Speaker, how will this government address the backlog of repairs that we have across the province and ensure that our children are in safe and well-equipped classrooms? Good question. The Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I do appreciate the question from the member opposite. I'm working with the Minister of Infrastructure to accelerate building schools in this province. We brought forth legislation designed to help fix the problem cited, which is there are too many schools that need repair and it takes too long to get it done. In this bill, we're going to accelerate the approval process. We're going to allow joint use projects with communities, partners to build better recreational facilities for our kids. In the budget, $14 billion is committed over the next decade to build new schools, $550 million this year alone. And the Auditor General has requested and recommended to government to invest 2.5% of our budget on maintenance and renewal in the GSN. We have done that. We are providing that stability and those funding guarantees to school boards. We know there is much more to do. If the members opposite want to improve the state of schools, they will vote for the Better Schools and Student Outcomes Act to ensure we Spons. deliver schools quicker and get things done for the children of this province. Supplementary question. Speaker, I invite the minister to come to my riding and see some of the conditions. Some of the schools repair is the same amount as actually building an entire school itself. Yes, Speaker, not only are our schools crumbling, but the government's continued underfunding of our education system is leading to cuts in teachers and education workers. And these cuts have resulted in oversized classrooms, inadequate specialized learning programs, and, the, and a lack of mental health support. Speaker, this has a direct and detrimental impact on our children's education. So my question is again, will this government provide our children with the support that they need instead of putting pressure on our already underfunded education system? Thank you very much. Minister of Education. Speaker, I'm very proud because of the strong leadership of members from Scarborough, from our government. We are building new schools in that community after years of repair backlog. Mr. Speaker, in addition to that, we're building subways in Scarborough and renewing long-term care in hospitals. We're investing across the board to give hope to families in Scarborough. When it comes to education, just this morning, the Ontario Human Rights Commission issued a statement on the legislation posted. And they said the OHRC is pleased to read that the government of Ontario is committed to overhauling the language curriculum and screening all young children as recommended in its Right to Read report. We have strong support from Dyslexia Canada, from special education families, from the parent associations of Ontario, demanding that we lift standards and we do better for kids. We just announced a $690 million increase. The entire Ministry of Education budget, when you compare to the peak of spending under Premier Wynne, is 27% higher. We are investing more, we are expecting more for children in this province, and we're going to continue to stand up for families in Ontario. The next question. The member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. 
Ontario's food processing industry is a core pillar of our province's economic success and sustainability. And in my riding at Brampton East, there are some of the largest employers with companies like Sierra Processing, Sofina Foods, Maple Leaf Foods, and bringing high quality food to our plates every single day. The success of Ontario is tied to the success of these companies and their employees, ensuring that we enable success that is an important priority. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Could the Minister please explain how the government is supporting food processing businesses in my riding. The Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to share with the House today that Ontario is Canada's food hub when it comes to processing. And uh, the member's absolutely right. From Brampton East, we have amazing food processors right in his home riding. And I appreciate the question very much. Just recently, we hosted a food summit with over 200 participants. And at that summit, we celebrated good work that our government has initiated. For instance, the Food Security and Stable Supply Chain Fund, as well as the strategic Strategic Agri-Food Processing Fund. We're building more capacity because the world is looking to Ontario. But I want to share with you as well that at the summit I was very proud to launch the Agri-Food Energy Efficiency Cost Saving Initiative because it's processors like in the members riding that are looking to modernize and looking for ways to reduce cost of production. Fonts. So through the $10 million fund we're helping food processors identify and increase efficiencies throughout the processing plants. Thank you, member for Brampton East. Supplement. Thank you to the Minister for her response and doing a wonderful job hosting the Ontario Food Summit. As was reinforced to me during the summit, this sector is crucial to the continued growth of our economy and building a stronger Ontario. It's important that our agri-food food industry in Ontario is competitive and as possible so. So can the Minister explain how the Energy Efficiency Program will contribute to reducing costs for our food processors here in Ontario? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much. And again, I want to thank the member opposite for participating in the Food Summit because food production affects everyone in this province. And the students that are in the galleries today, I want to assure you that there are amazing careers, careers for life in Ontario's agri food sector. And I encourage you to research those opportunities because our government stands with Ontario farmers and processors. And through the Agri Food Energy Cost Savings Initiative, we are are looking to cost share up to 20% of all energy saving initiatives that processors in this province undertake up to a maximum of $300,000 and why are we doing this because we want our story to be sustainable we want to be ensuring that processors are modernizing and embracing every opportunity to reduce costs of production that ultimately translates Response. into affordable good quality food on store shelves throughout this Very province nice. thank you for Thunder Bay Superior North. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. This morning in the media studio, Maria Sardellis and Sherry Vanderven spoke about the terrible suffering caused by the illegal use of the Trespass Act by care homes. Far too often, when caregivers make complaints about poor standards of care, facility operators retaliate by using the Ontario Trespass Act illegally to permanently ban uh, entrance to family members. Will this government ensure that care home operators cannot hide from accountability by using the Trespass Act to punish patients and their loved ones? Good question. Mr. Long Term Care. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question from the member. Uh, um, I can appreciate that the member wasn't uh, here in the last parliament, uh, uh, so she uh, was probably unaware of the Fixing Long-Term Care Act, uh, uh, which, of course, uh, enshrined uh, a residence bill of rights uh, within uh, within the law. Mr. Speaker, we learned during COVID how important it was that uh, uh, that family and friends uh, are able to visit their loved ones uh, in long-term care homes uh, across the province of Ontario, and that's why we enshrined that uh, uh, within the residence uh, bill of rights. Uh, uh, the member, it might uh, please them. Well, I guess it would displease the member to know that, of course, that uh, uh, the NDP voted against uh, that piece of legislation in the last parliament. But uh, despite that, Mr. Speaker, we made the uh, we made the commitment to ensure that 
that it is uh, within the, the Fixing Long-Term Care Act. We've actually gone a step further, Mr. Speaker. We've ensured that every single home across the province of Ontario posts uh, uh, the Residents' Bill of Rights right in, uh, in within every Response. single long-term care home across the province. And on top of that, Mr. Speaker, we are still building out 60,000 new and upgraded long-term care homes. Well, we had 27,000 additional staff. Again, they voted against that, but I think we're on the right track. Question. Thank you, Speaker. We know, in fact, that these trespass orders are being used every single day illegally to ban people from visiting their family members. Mm -hmm. In March of 2021, this House unanimously passed a motion presented by my colleague from Ottawa Centre stating that the Government of Ontario would, and I quote, provide clear direction to operators of retirement, long-term care, and group homes that they cannot use the Trespass, Act to, uh, Trespass to Property Act to ban family members who speak out about their loved ones' living conditions. I ask, will this government fulfill this commitment from 2021 by posting clear direction in publicly accessible spaces in every care facility in Ontario and ensure also that police forces no longer misapply the Trespass Act by blocking families from visiting their loved ones. Mr. Long-Term Care. Yeah, I, I would agree with the member. I, I found it odd that uh, that the NDP uh, in the last parliament actually voted against the Fixing Long-Term Care Act because here's what it says: as you enter the doorway of a long-term care home, despite uh, uh, the heckling of the member for uh, for Waterloo, who voted against this and of course voted against the millions of dollars in extra staffing for her order riding. But here's what it says, Mr. Speaker: it says. Order. On the residents' bill of right, in the doorway of every water long -term come to order. Home, every resident has the right to receive visitors uh, of their choice without interference. So, job done, as you've asked in your question. It says every resident has a right to ongoing safe support from their caregivers to support the physical, mental, social, and emotional well-being. Mr. Speaker, now this is the wording that appears in every single long-term care home across the province, Order. along with the residents' bill of rights. Mr. Speaker, they voted against Response. the residents' bill of rights. They voted against the fixing. Long term care act. They voted Some against 50,000 new and upgraded homes. They voted against 27,000 additional health care workers. They vote against everything. Thank you very much. The next question the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Colleges and Universities. All Ontarians deserve to have access to health care that they need when they need it. And due to the neglect of the previous Liberal government, Ontario needs more doctors to alleviate the strain on our health care system. But unfortunately, too many Ontario students are going abroad for medical school because they haven't been able to find residency spots here in their home province. Our government must take decisive steps to educate and retain doctors locally in order to connect people to care closer to home. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to expand Ontario's medical school system? Minister of Colleges and Universities to respond. And thank you to the member from Eglinton Lawrence for this important question. Our government recognizes that in order to build up our health care system, we need to ensure that students pursuing medical studies have access to world-class post-secondary education. As part of that effort, we need to ensure that we have the capacity to train doctors locally. And Speaker, this government is delivering. In 2022 alone, we added 160 undergraduate spaces and 295 postgraduate medical seats to be implemented over the next five years the largest expansion of Ontario's medical school system in over a decade. Wow. And as outlined in Budget 2023, we are building on that expansion by investing $33 million over three years to add another 100, and undergra 100 undergraduate seats and 154 postgraduate seats beginning in 2024, prioritizing Ontario students. Speaker, this means that by 2028, Response. Ontario will have the capacity to train 1,212 undergraduate medical students and 1,637 postgraduate students annually. I can assure you that the future of medical education in Ontario is bright. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. This is welcome news for my constituents. I've heard from many that their children can't get 
medical training here and would like to come and live here again. Uh, so that's great news and I'm sure in other communities it's welcome as well. Expanding post-secondary education opportunities will make it easier for our homegrown doctors of tomorrow to receive training and provide world-class health care right here in their own communities. And this is one of many important initiatives our government is taking to help build up our health care workforce. However, I know there are some regions of our province where the need for doctors and other health care professionals is more extreme. It's up to our government to implement solutions that respond to these local health care needs. So, Speaker, can the Minister please explain how our government will prioritize medical training programs to support communities that have the most need? Mr. Colleges and University. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you once again to the member for their interest and their work in building a health care system that delivers for all Ontarians. Statistics show that doctors generally stay and practice in the area where they complete their medical education. Recognizing this, our government has taken a pragmatic approach to ensure that we're increasing medical school seats in regions across the province, focusing on areas that need it most. Because no matter where you live, everyone deserves access to a world-class healthcare system. That's why we also announced the Scarborough Academy of Medicine under the University of Toronto and the Northern Ontario Medical School, as well as the first ever medical school in Brampton which will help solidify local health care needs in the region for generations, something the Liberals and NDP promised but never delivered. Speaker, this is how we are building Ontario's health care system to be stronger, more resilient what? and better than ever, and that begins with a solid foundation in education. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier, my constituent Janice complains that the surgical wait times are simply too long in Ontario. She shared with me a BC government website which publicly lists the, the specialists as well as the surgical wait times. Very convenient tool. Since the Premier won't keep his promise to eliminate surgical backlogs five years after he was elected to do so, will he at least do the very minimum, which is to create a surgical wait time portal for Ontario patients just like the one that the BC government has created? Created for their uh, residents. Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you. You know, the, I'm uh, very excited to use this opportunity to talk about some of the innovations that we are doing under the Your Health Plan. And it, of course, includes expansion of surgical uh, capacity, both within hospital and within community. You know, when we expand our surgical capacity in community with community integrated surgical centers, we actually have more space available in our hospitals to do those more complex surgeries that are so critical. And, of course, the emergencies that happen every single day in, in the province of Ontario. But because of the investments that we're making in the Your Health commitment, we are ensuring that uh, capacity is expanding in the province of Ontario, and very specifically in terms of uh, posting and making people aware. Of course, our Your Health partners uh, at Ontario Health are uh, monitoring Spots. and publicly posting regularly where our surgical wait times need to be improved. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And back to the Premier. You know, I, I'm hearing a lot about uh, the, the innovation that's coming from this province in this particular government, but we're not seeing the results on the ground. And unfortunately, surgical wait times are now longer than ever before. So let me just rephrase this. The, P, the BC NDB government has created a central system for faster referrals. Their constituents, their residents can go right online and see exactly what they need to see and get that information in a timely fashion. This Conservative government has scrapped the local health integration networks on the eve of a global health pandemic. And under this government, there's now more pro uh, private, for-profit companies charging for similar services. Speaker, this is a disaster for Ontarians. Why does this government insist on making health care worse and more expensive for Ontario residents? Thank you. Minister Health. The facts are, Speaker, that Ontario leads Canada 
in our surgical wait times. We actually have the best, uh, the shortest wait times in all of Canada. That doesn't mean we can't be better, and we will get better as we expand our integrated community surgical centers. Uh, but the reality is that we should be very proud of the fact that we are now back to pre-pandemic levels because of almost a billion dollar investment over three years in the ability for both uh, hospitals and surgical centers to be able to expand their services. We've been able to do that during the pandemic and as we see the pandemic wane. It is very, very important that we continue to do that valuable work with hospitals, with integrated community surgical centers. We will do it. We've laid it out with Bill 60 and the Your Health Plan and we are getting it done. Thank you. Member for Brampton North. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. And it's okay if you guys clap when I get up. That's all right. <laughs> I, uh, this past Sunday, my community of Brampton had the pleasure of hosting uh, over 5,000 hockey fans at the CAA Centre for the International Ice Hockey Federation's Women's World Championships. The gold medal game was certainly an exciting hockey match. Our Team Canada played so hard right until the end, and we're all very proud of their efforts. Medals and awards went to numerous athletes, but each and every one of these women is a true champion and an all-star. They are positive role models, providing encouragement for other women to stay active in sport. However, according to a national study, unfortunately, 50% of girls will drop out of sports by adolescence. More must be done to raise the profile of women in sports and create opportunities for greater participation. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government Question. is promoting active involvement in sport for women? Mr. Tourism, Culture and Sport. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member from Brampton North for a number of things, your enthusiasm and your approach and what you're doing in your community. And I think there were five, yeah, absolutely. And I thought you had cloned yourself to 5,000 based on that gold medal game because the, the fans in, in Brampton were unbelievable with their support for Team Canada. Outstanding. Uh, this government invested $500,000 in the IIHF World Women's Championship in Brampton and it was a massive success. Success on a number of fronts, Mr. Speaker. What it does from a tourism and a culture and sport perspective in the community, how it drives visitorship, I, st I stepped back at one point because I got there early, as I often do at a sporting event, especially when you're involved with it emotionally, to try to get rid of some attention. And what I saw when the doors opened were as many children as I saw adults, young girls that played hockey throughout Ontario, wearing their jerseys, showing up with their parents, and getting engaged. If they're engaged, that means they're looking at these women on the ice, especially Team Canada, and using them as a source of motivation and instinct. Thank you. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. Uh, we certainly saw and experienced excitement and fun in Brampton last week. And, and sports events like this one in my community not only inspire uh, future generations of athletes and increase physical activity, but they also contribute to the social fabric of our communities. Um, it's also encouraging to see the positive effects that a major event had like this, uh, uh, like this one had for the businesses in Brampton and across Ontario. Many Brampton hotels, restaurants and shops welcomed the boost in occupancy and sales as people enjoyed themselves in and around our city. Uh, it was a true winning experience for everyone. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting amateur sporting events and boosting tourism opportunities in local communities like mine? Mr. Tourism, Culture and Sport. Mr. Speaker, again, thank you for the question. I could talk for hours on what sport does and what it delivers to young people and how it helps them affect and positively affect their lives, but I won't bore you, at least at this point. Uh, the Ontario Sport Hosting Program is designed to help communities host national and international events. Again, it goes back to that tourism, culture and sport piece that work awfully well together to drive business to the economy. To that point, in the last, well, since 2018, we've supported 155 sporting events that equates to about 
$81 million of impact in the communities that were hosting these events. That's a big deal. I was just in Ottawa and we are investing $300,000 in the World Rugby Pac-4 International Tournament to be held this year in July. The best of the best will compete in Ottawa. One of those four is Canada, which means we're one of the best of the best, including New Zealand, Australia and the U.S. Once again, a great Spots. example for all people in sport, but especially young women who can be motivated and inspired by watching their heroes on the ice or on the field. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning.